Hey Paranormies, welcome back or welcome to the light side of the paranormal. I'm Jenna and this is going to be your part two of me reacting to Slapped Ham's video warning. These scary mysteries left authorities shook. If you haven't seen the part one of this video, please click this link here and go watch the first video. Don't forget to go over to Slapped Ham's channel and check him out and give him a like and subscribe. I will link that up here as well. Let's get right into part two of this video. The case of Cornelia Zangiri Bandi is one of the longest paranormal mysteries to still plague the experts. Mm. Her bizarre death has gone unsolved since 1731. Cornelia was an Italian noblewoman born in 1664. During her lifetime, she married and had seven children, two of whom would go on to become important figures in the Catholic Church. However, these children were not the most noteworthy part of her legacy. Instead, Cornelia would be known and remembered for the unusual way in which she died at age 66. On Cornelia's last night alive, her dinner companions noted that she seemed unusually lethargic. They didn't read into her behaviour all that much, assuming that she had consumed too much brandy. <laughs> Cornelia was known to be a heavy drinker and often applied brandy mixed with camphor to her body to relieve pain. After dinner, her maid helped her to her room where the two spent three hours praying together. This was a normal part of the Countess's routine and also raised no red flags. Okay. However, Cornelia failed to appear at the usual time the following morning. The maid went into Cornelia's bedchambers to check on her where she made a startling discovery. Nearly every surface of the room was covered in soot. The maid discovered a pile of ash a few feet away from the bed this heap, along with a few assorted body parts, was all that remained of the Countess. Many assumed that the Countess had burned to death. The bedsheet suggested that she had risen at some point during the night and an oil lamp was found in the room. However, further inspection showed that the lamp was empty of oil. In addition, the fabrics and other surfaces in the room were covered in soot, but otherwise undamaged. How could Cornelia have burned to death without singeing other flammable items in the room? Many believe that the death of Countess Cornelia Zangiri Bandi is an early example of the phenomenon known as spontaneous, spontaneous. human combustion. Right. A peculiar anomaly in which the human body seems to catch fire without any external source of ignition. There have been Crazy. numerous documented cases over the years, and experts are yet to stumble upon a reasonable explanation for the deaths. It is a known thing as well in spontaneous human combustion that when the body does burn up, it doesn't catch other items on fire or start house fires usually. If the person was sitting or laying down, it might burn the surrounding area where they were sitting, but it doesn't catch and everything goes up in flames, which is so strange. It's usually quite contained. Spontaneous human combustion is one of the weirdest things to me. It totally blows my mind. I think because my I can't wrap my brain around <laughs> and it scares me a lot. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. And the fact that they don't know why this could happen to you at any given moment is terrifying. The sleeping sickness sweeping through Kazakhstan's Kalachi village has utterly baffled scientists for years. The village that fell Leaving asleep. his home one morning, village resident Viktor Kazachenko set out to run a few errands. However, he awoke confused six days later, having slept the entire time. Upon waking, six Kazachenko days? felt unwell, on edge, and not quite all there. Did I hear that right? Many other residents of Kalachi have suffered the same fate. Falling asleep for days, the residents have awoken feeling nauseated and dizzy, with horrible headaches and even memory loss resulting from their time asleep. Dehydration. The mysterious ailment has plagued over 150 residents of the village, wow. with many suffering more than once. The sleeping plague that is tormenting the citizens of Kalachi has become one of the most chilling mysteries the government of Kazakhstan has ever faced. Wow. Never Attempting to get to the of bottom this. of the mystery, scientists tested radiation levels yeah. as well as the concentration of heavy metal salts in the area. Both results came back normal. However, it was later determined that increased carbon monoxide levels from a nearby abandoned mine might have been responsible. That might do it. <laughs> the government has since offered voluntary relocation assistance to the citizens of Kalachi. No kidding. However, not all residents are so quick to leave their lifelong homes behind. 
finding themselves unsure if they'll once again be struck down by this mysterious affliction. That is weird. I would move. Another of the Great War's bizarre wartime mysteries features a colonel who was badly injured during a battle. A grenade exploded close to him, and he tragically lost one of his arms. This devastating injury forced him to be evacuated from the battlefield by medics. Not long after, several of the colonel's men saw him on the battlefield. A sergeant major notified the company's acting commander that the colonel had returned. The commander looked up and sure enough, the colonel was standing nearby. The commander reported that the colonel wore his cap to the side as he always did, his boots were caked in mud, and that he had binoculars around his neck. The commander began walking towards the colonel, but stopped when he dropped his walking stick. When he looked back up, the colonel was gone. The commander quickly headed towards the company headquarters and questioned numerous other men. They all reported that they had seen the colonel, but that he had disappeared suddenly. Then one of the men made a startling observation. When the men had seen the colonel, he had both of his arms. Whoa. The commander and other soldiers were perplexed by this mystery. Their confusion grew when they later found out what had happened to the colonel after he was evacuated. Shortly after leaving the battlefield before even reaching a field hospital, the colonel had succumbed to his injuries and died. It happened so quickly that there was no chance he could have reappeared on the battlefield. He was a ghost. In 1959, nine hikers mysteriously disappeared near the Dyatlov Pass in Russia. Almost 20 years later, on February 24, 1978, a similar disappearance occurred near Palmetto, California. Because of the similarities between the two unsolved mysteries, the latter incident became known as the American Dyatlov Pass. I'm just going to pause it there for a second and say that we have a video in the works coming about the Dyatlov Pass incident. It absolutely blows my mind and I need to make an entire video about it. So that is coming. I absolutely had no idea that there was a similar circumstance in another country. I'm kind of blown away right now. I'm really wanting to hear what the rest of this is. The case began when Gary Mathias, Jack Hewitt, William Sterling, Ted Weir and Jack Madruga left a basketball game in Chico, California. None made it home. Their families quickly organised a search that eventually located the car in which the group had been travelling. The car was stuck in the mud near Palmetto, 30 miles from Chico. Even though the car was stuck, the five men could have easily gotten it out. The car had adequate gas and no other signs of a problem, yet there was no sign of the missing men. Months later, Ted Weir's body was found on a mattress in a cabin about a mile away. What? His shoeless body was covered by a makeshift shroud and surrounded by open food cans. There was no sign that the cabin's heat had been turned on or that a fire had been made. Weir had lost a significant amount of weight and grown a beard before dying of starvation suggesting he was alive for several months after his disappearance. Authorities were puzzled. How could he have died of starvation when surrounded by open food containers? That's so Why strange. wasn't he wearing shoes and who covered his body? The skeletal remains of three of the other men were later found nearby, but provided no additional clues. The prevailing theory is that the men's mental illnesses were to blame for the incident. George Mathias, who has never been located, suffered from schizophrenic episodes, and the other four men had various mental illnesses. Authorities theorised that Mathias had a stress-induced episode, and the others left the car to avoid being harmed. However, this theory doesn't explain why Weir would have slowly starved to death in a cabin full of food, or why the others would have left the safety of the cabin. The mystery officially remains unsolved. That blows me away. Mysteries like that I find so intriguing because the part of you that just needs to know what happened to these people, for him to be alive for months and then die of starvation with food everywhere, I don't understand. I need answers. Predating the internet, the 1-800 golf tip mystery has only been kept alive thanks to sleuths who remember this sensation from the 1990s. In a detailed never heard post of to Reddit, user oh, I Get Jokes has compiled a mix of first-hand experience calling the number, as well as various other accounts from around the internet of what others can remember. Advertised the old-fashioned way, using at least one and possibly more billboards across Canada and even the United States, 
The phone number seemed to be designed to call in in order to receive advice about golf. <laughs> Yeah. However, upon calling the number, users quickly became perplexed as to what they were hearing. The only sound on the other end of the line, regardless of how many times it was called, was the voice of a man counting from 1 to 10. The heavily accented voice would repeat the numbers oh, over chills. and over again until a loud siren could be heard after the third or fourth time. The mystery surrounding this phone number has had people talking about it for years. That's strange. As further explained in a video posted to YouTube by channel Barely Sociable, a website named 1800golftip.com has appeared as a dedicated space for those who remember their experiences with the mysterious number. That's what several cool. sources cite is a distinct variation in the placement of a notable pause between the numbers, seemingly impossible for a pre-recorded line. For so many yeah. people to have the same memory of the recording, except for the variances in timing, only serves to deepen the mystery. Some have speculated that the number might have originally been set up by the government as a way to test mind control techniques. In fact, some worry the effects of the recordings have outlived the now defunct phone number, perhaps brainwashing thousands. Yeah, I was Further just thinking research that. into the number proves its history is complicated and convoluted with the number now redirecting to a phone sex hotline. It's unclear what exactly happened to the original owner of the number or what their intention was. However, the phone number's legacy has far outlived itself, wow. proving a mystery to online audiences affected by it even decades later. For more information about the 1800 golf tip number, check out Barely Sociable's video on YouTube. Crazy. I'll put a link in the description box below. I don't know this number at all i don't remember that maybe it wasn't canadian maybe it was american do you guys remember that comment down below and let me know if you have any memories of this or if you called the number i'm so curious this is like the super weird situation to call a number and have that happen um and the placement of the pauses very strange on february 13 2017 abigail williams and liberty german disappeared from the delphi historic trails in delphi indiana Authorities assumed that the girls had gotten lost when they failed to appear at their check-in location. However, their bodies were found the next day near the trail where they had disappeared. The details of their deaths are unknown, but authorities determined that they had been murdered. Mm. What seems like a simple yet tragic case quickly became one of the area's eeriest unsolved mysteries. Soon after the girls' bodies were discovered, police discovered strange recordings on Liberty German's phone. A muffled voice can be heard saying, guys, down the hill. It appeared that the girl had begun recording while her phone was inside her pocket. Authorities have called these actions heroic. The eerie recordings were circulated in hopes that someone would recognise the voice and allow authorities to bring the killer to justice. Thousands of tips poured in, but none led to the killer's identity. Police later released a longer recording, but parts of the video are still being kept under wraps. Followers of the case believe that the recording captured the girls' deaths and that yes. authorities are reluctant to make that portion of the video public. I remember this. Cameras on the trail captured a grainy shot of a man walking alone on the trail near the time that the girls went missing. Authorities believe that this man may be the culprit, but have been unable to identify him. Despite the evidence captured in Liberty German's frightening recording, the murderer remains at large. Ugh. And she tried and didn't succeed. And Many wartime mysteries are difficult to prove, none more so than the enigmatic Operation Cone of Power. In June of 1940, France succumbed to the German forces after only six weeks of fighting. With its neighbour across the sea under German control, Britain began preparing for what they believed to be an inevitable invasion from the sea. In fact, intelligence suggested that Hitler's forces had already begun preparing ships for the invasion. Many cities along England's southern coast began preparing to defend against the German barges. The coast was barricaded with sandbags and barbed wire, and volunteers kept a constant watch on the horizon. Yet the German ships never appeared. According to Gerald Gardner, a retired British civil servant, the citizens of England's coastal towns should be thanking a group of witches for their salvation. Gardner has stated that during World War II, as during other dangerous wars, the country's witches gathered together to combine their power against enemy forces. 
Apparently the sea witches met in an ancient forest on the eve of Lammas Day to weave their spells. Together they projected messages into Hitler's mind, urging him to believe that his troops couldn't cross the sea. The military, when it became aware of the ritual, mockingly gave it the codename Operation Cone of Power. Gardner, a founder of the modern-day religion of Wicca, researched this operation by interviewing descendants of the witches and scouring their diaries. He claims to have found numerous accounts of the mysterious ritual. He believes that although no one can prove that the witches were responsible for stopping the German forces, he is certain that the ritual did take place. Gardner even found evidence that two of the witches partaking in the ritual mysteriously died. Rumour has it that these witches died for the cause, giving every last ounce of strength to repel Hitler's forces. Oh. Others are less keen to believe these stories. Historian Ronald Hutton has stated that there's no real evidence to support Gardner's claims, and that the story could be a fabrication meant to make modern-day Wiccans seem more patriotic instead of as enemies. Oh, please. Beginning in the 1850s, a spirit known as John King was alleged to appear regularly during seances held by mediums Frank Hearn and Charles Williams. 1870, they took a new medium under their wing, Florence Cook. It's said that Florence soon began manifesting a different spirit, Katie King, believed to be John King's daughter. At the seances run by Florence, believers would gather in a dimly lit room with no one else present in the house. Spiritualists believe that spirits would only appear under these specific conditions, but skeptics asserted that it was just a ruse to hide the fact that the seances were a hoax. The medium, in this case Florence, would be secluded in a dark space, usually a large cabinet or bedroom. After a time, the spirit of Katie King would emerge to interact with the believers, even touching their hands. Often the guests would be shown the covered figure of the medium lying in the cabinet, However, the figure was never uncovered, allowing skeptics to speculate about what was really under the fabric. At one seance, investigator William Volkman attended on behalf of a rival medium in an effort to discredit Florence. He noted that Katie looked very similar to Florence and rose from his chair during the seance to grab the spirit by the waist. He accused her of being a fraud. The others in the room wrestled her away and returned her to the cabinet. They later hired another investigator, Sir William Crooks, for support. During some seances with Crooks, the spirit of Katie King allowed herself to be weighed and measured. The measurements varied, but Katie was always taller than Florence and had a different complexion. Some believers insisted that at times they could see both Katie and Florence together clearly and that it was impossible for Florence to be masquerading as a spirit. Florence Cook and Katie King caused a great deal of controversy in their time, but the truth about their seances remains a mystery. I'm just going to pause there and let you know that we have also made a similar video about a related case to this. If you are interested in that, I will link it right here. We'll keep going. On November 22 of 1941, a strange ad appeared in the New Yorker magazine. At the top of the ad was a headline reading, Aktun, warning alert. Beneath was a photo of people playing dice in an air raid shelter, and text that read, We hope you'll never have to spend a long winter's night in an air raid shelter, but we were just thinking, it's only common sense to be prepared. If you're not too busy between now and Christmas, why not sit down and plan a list of things you'll want to have on hand? <laughs> and though it's no time, really, to be thinking of what's fashionable, we bet that most of your friends will remember to include those intriguing dice and chips, which makes Chicago's favourite game, The Deadly Double. What? Throughout the magazine, there are other smaller ads featuring the name of the game and dice with the numbers 12 and 7. The ad was certainly odd. The reference to an air raid shelter seemed out of place, as at the time the United States had stated that it would not get involved with the war in Europe. In addition, the numbers on the dice were not numbers that would typically appear on such game pieces. The content of the ad became the focus of a military investigation two weeks later, when Japanese forces attacked a United States base at Pearl Harbor, thus prompting the country to enter into the war. Mm. The attack occurred on December 7, reflecting the numbers 12 and 7 on the dice in the ad. I mean, there's also a 5 and a 0 there. This paired with a strange reference and to 20. air raid shelters, 
led some to believe that the ad had been placed as a warning about the impending attack. Wow, interesting. Officials were assigned to investigate the matter, but everything led to dead ends. The ad had been submitted in person and had been paid for in cash. The employee who took the money couldn't recall anything about the person who submitted the copy. Was the ad a cryptic warning or merely a bizarre coincidence? Without additional evidence about the mysterious individual who walked into the offices of the New Yorker and placed the ad, the truth remains an enigma. February 14, 2000 was a windy, rainy day in Shelby, North Carolina. Early that morning, before the rest of the family was awake, nine-year-old Asher Degree packed up items into her backpack and left the house. Between 3.45 and 4.15 a.m., several motorists saw her walking along Highway 18. When one attempted to approach her, she left the road and ran into the woods. This is the last time anyone saw her. What? She was soon reported missing, setting into motion one of America's longest unsolved mysteries. At first, many believed that Asher had simply run away from home. Her life was sheltered, spent primarily with family and at church. Some investigators suggested that she had run away to escape these restrictions. However, Asher's family described her as an extremely shy child who would be unlikely to set out from home alone. Upon further investigation, authorities found nothing in Asher's life to suggest that she would have reason to run away. Yet, all of the doors and windows in the house had been locked, indicating that Asher left the house under her own volition and locked the doors behind her. Wow. During an extensive search, a few of Asher's personal belongings were located in a shed near the spot where Asher disappeared into the woods. No further clues were found until a year and a half after she went missing when Asher's backpack was located during an excavation of a construction project along Highway 18. The backpack was wrapped in plastic, but additional information about this vital clue has not been made public. Years later, the FBI publicly asked for information on two other possible clues. A copy of McElliott's Pool by Dr. Seuss that had been checked out from the school library and a white t-shirt featuring the new kids on the block. Pausing for a second. My leg just died. This is the last video. So sorry. Let's just wrap this up. Unclear how these items relate to the disappearance, as investigators have been tight-lipped about the case. So why did Asha leave her house on that grey, rainy morning? What happened to her after she left? Authorities are still struggling to answer these questions. So sorry about my light, guys. Oh, this light is awful. <laughs> like I'm melting. If you guys stayed till the end, thank you so much for watching this. Make sure to give it a like if you enjoy when we make videos like this. And please let us know in the comments below what you thought of this video, what you thought of the cases that I reacted to. If you have any other thoughts, feelings, concerns, nicely. Please let's all just be nice to each other and leave a comment down below. Please also check out in the description below. The link is there to our Instagram account. Please go over there and follow us on Instagram. The links to Alice and myself's personal accounts are there. So you are welcome to follow us in our personal lives as well. And that is it for me for tonight. Thank you guys again so much for watching and keep on creeping on. Bye!